Hello, this is Jody, and this presentation will cover part one for coronary artery disease. This follows along with your textbook. So please use your textbook as a resource for this topic. I will go a little bit more in depth um, than your book goes into, um, but I definitely want you guys knowing this information before you come into your first class. So just a quick overview, look at the image of the heart and notice the arteries that are feeding the heart muscle. So you see these arteries right here and they are feeding the heart muscle itself, the myocardium. The heart muscle receives blood, which contains oxygen and electrolytes and nutrients to support the heart muscle contraction. So if we have impaired blood flow to the heart, the heart muscle is not going to perform the way that it should. And we should see the, the patient or client have some symptoms if they have impaired blood flow. But we will talk, you know, later on about how, you know, sometimes and very often, I should say, the first sign of coronary artery disease is a heart attack or angina. So what happens? We'll discuss three things that can happen when blood flow to the heart muscle is impaired. Angina, which is chest pain that is caused by reduced blood flow to the heart muscle. In other words, if you have a patient who has trauma to the chest, maybe they're in a car accident, something like that, and they have pain in their chest, that would not be referred to as angina, okay? That would be somebody, we would say something like patient has chest pain secondary to trauma. So when we talk about angina or angina, some people say, we are talking about chest pain that is caused because of reduction in blood flow to the heart muscle. Acute coronary syndrome is something we will talk about, which is a sudden reduction in blood flow to the heart and acute myocardial infarction may be preceded by acute coronary syndrome. But a myocardial infarction is prolonged ischemia. So prolonged ischemia is that prolonged lack of blood oxygen to the tissue that will result in irreversible damage to the tissue, okay, which is caused by a complete blockage to an artery or an area of the heart muscle. So if we go back to the picture and we look at this picture, so say the patient starts having some chest pain and they do a test, and we'll talk more about the revascular, revascularization and um, angiograms in class, but we'll say that, you know, the docs go in, they do an angiogram to look to see if there's blockages you know, blocking the blood flow to the heart, and they see that the patient has a huge clot right in here. If that happens, the blood flow cannot get down past that blood clot, or it may have a very narrow pathway to get down, so everything below that is not getting the blood flow in that heart muscle. And if you could see if that blockage was way up here, or if it was way up here and the blood flow can't get way down into here to this heart muscle, that patient's going to be in a lot of trouble. So this is why teaching health promotion strategies um, is very important. We want to prevent the buildup of plaque in the arteries, which can lead to blockages in those muscles, which can damage the heart muscle. So cholesterol management is important, whether it's achieved through diet and exercise or a combination of diet, exercise, and medication. Like I said before, the first sign of CAD is generally an acute event, like a myocardial infarction. So teaching clients at risk for CAD is beneficial. So if we identify patients have risk factors for coronary artery disease, we want to teach them so that we're preventing them from having something like a heart attack so that you know, that they don't damage their heart muscle. So let's move on to the next slide here. So as you can see too, before I move on, this is atherosclerosis, which just means plaque buildup in the vessels. So this is a normal artery. You're going to get nice, smooth blood flow going through this artery. Once we have this plaque develop, you can start to see that this is going to narrow that blood flow going to the heart, okay? And then what can happen is pieces of this can break off and totally occlude a vessel. So this animation demonstrates how plaque buildup, which is atherosclerosis, can block blood flow. If it happens over a long period of time, the patient may develop something called collateral circulation, 
Collateral circulation is minor vessels which become active and reroute the blood flow around the blockage. However, this won't happen if the blockage forms suddenly. So let's see. So you can see the blood flow is flowing nice and smooth, but then you start to see this plaque build up and you can start to see those blood cells start to um, clog up there. This is collateral circulation. So if you could see that this happens over time, so play this again, this plaque buildup happens over time. And then what's going to happen is over here, you're going to see a collateral vessel be activated, which then will reroute the blood around the blockage. Okay, but this doesn't always happen. And it doesn't happen if that, like if you were to have plaque buildup, that wasn't really, it wasn't really so severe that collateral circulation was developed, you know, and if you had a piece of this break off that totally occluded, you're not going to have this collateral circulation. So think of what could block blood flow. Envision traffic flow in busy city streets. When things are good, the traffic flows smoothly. But if there is an accident or a parade or construction, traffic slows down significantly, right? And it's going to take longer for the cars to get to their destination. Now think of blood traveling in the body. Blood needs to flow smoothly so they can provide oxygen, electrolytes, and fluid to the organs and tissue. If something like a partial occlusion, a drop in blood pressure, so maybe somebody is bleeding uncontrollably and they have this major drop in blood pressure, or you know they have shock from infection, a spasm of the vessels, which can happen uh, you know, if a patient's using cocaine or something like that, they have vasospasms and that can block blood flow. It's going to take longer for the blood to get to its destination, to the organs, to the tissues. That delay in blood flow to the heart causes symptoms, and the most common symptom is angina, right? Again, angina is chest pain from decreased blood flow to the heart muscle. There are three different types of angina. There's stable angina, which is predictable. In other words, if a client has known coronary artery disease, they may know um, that when they increase their heart rate too much with activity, okay, they will experience chest pain or angina, which may resolve quickly with rest and medication. Prinz metal is angina that is unpredictable. The patient has known CD and experiences angina, but they can't predict when the pain will occur. But it's generally at the same type um, it's generally the same type of pain and it often happens at night. Then there's unstable angina. So this is chest pain that occurs in an increasing frequency. And this means that your client has an, an increased risk for myocardial infarction. So acute coronary syndrome occurs when there is a sudden decrease in perfusion to the heart muscle. If you review the graphic on this slide, we will take it as far as the cardiac markers. The most common cardiac marker used to help diagnose MI is troponin. So for example, you are caring for a 62-year-old client on a med surge unit who has developed a GI bleed. The client's BB, uh, blood pressure BP has quickly dropped to 78 over 52, and the client is complaining of chest pain and dyspnea. Okay, this type of chest pain would be considered angina. You send stat blood work, which includes a troponin, and you start the client on a fluid bonus, a fluid bolus and obtain an EKG, which shows sinus tachycardia. The blood work comes back and the troponin is negative, and based on the hemoglobin and hematocrit results, the client receives two units of blood stat. Between the fluid and the blood, the client's chest discover, discomfort and dyspnea resolve. The client experienced angina, okay, because of lack of blood flow to the heart. This would be considered acute coronary syndrome because it occurred suddenly and resolved once the underlying problem, the blood loss, was treated. Okay, so if you take the graphic and you say acute coronary syndrome, you do the EKG, you know, maybe the patient has no ST elevations, and their cardiac markers, their troponin is negative. If the troponin was positive, it's indicative of myocardial uh, damage, 
Okay, but this person's uh, troponin was negative. Okay, if it were positive, we'd go down to MI. So negative, we would say unstable angina. What was it caused by? What caused that sudden decreased blood flow to the heart muscle? It was blood loss from the GI bleed. Okay, so a patient can have acute coronary syndrome and not have a myocardial infarction. And that's kind of the point I'm trying to make with acute coronary syndrome is people often think, well, the patient has acute coronary syndrome, that must mean that they had a heart attack. Not necessarily. It could be that they had sudden decreased perfusion to the heart that was caused by something like a bleed or shock or something like that. So when we talk about myocardial infarction, the area um, and the amount of area of the myocardium that is impacted will determine the client's output, out, outcome and plan of care for management. The tissue death can be minimal and it can have no significant impact on the heart muscle contraction. That's good. You know, it was a nice warning sign. The patient had a heart attack, but they really suffered such minimal damage that heart contraction is still good. They can still, you know, function somewhat normally. However, like we said, if the blockage is like way up here and they're not getting blood flow at all down to this part of the heart, they're going to be in trouble and they're not going to have a good outcome. Okay. Um, and then, you know, but if the, let's say that the blockage is way down here, way down here. Okay. And so they're just getting a little bit of tissue damage right down here, but it's not enough tissue damage that's going to really impact contractility and perfusion. Okay, we'll say that this is the left coronary um, artery. This is the right coronary artery. So the left coronary artery goes down, feeds the left atrium, feeds the left ventricle. Well, we know that the left ventricle is the main pump that's going to pump blood to the body. Okay. So if you have a blockage way up here, blood flow can't get down at all to that left ventricle, the patient is really going to have a bad outcome. They're not going to make it, okay? Because if they kill off all of this tissue, then you're not going to get heart contraction and you're not going to be able to pump blood to the rest of the body. So there are really three rhythms per perfusion that, that you need to know for 212. You're obviously going to learn more for 222, but you really need to understand at normal sinus rhythm before you can understand an abnormal rhythm. So looking at normal sinus rhythm, um, the P wave represents atrial depolarization. So if you look at this, this is the P wave, is this little wave right here. So when you have this little wave right here, it means that the atria is contracting, okay? So this is the P, we have atrial contraction. The QRS is ventricular contraction, okay? And then the T wave just means that the heart is repolarizing so that it can get ready to do the same thing over and over again, right? So atrial contraction, ventricular contraction, repolarizing, kind of recharging to do that whole cycle again. Okay, so that's what you need to be looking at. If the heart rate is between 60 and 100, then it's a normal heart rate that is considered normal sinus rhythm. And it has to be regular, which means that the QRSs are going to march out evenly. Okay, so you have a nice steady heartbeat. It's regular. Uh, heart rate's between 60 and 100. You have a P, a P wave for every QRS and a T that follows. That is normal sinus rhythm. When we talk about an ST elevated MI, this is that at this very moment, the patient's heart, there's a part of the patient's heart that is not getting the blood flow that it needs. Okay. This means we need to do something right away. Okay. Versus a non ST elevated MI. A non ST elevated MI likely means that the patient has positive troponins, they have had some cardiac, uh, cardiac damage, but at this point it's evolved. Like there's nothing acutely going on. So a patient that comes in with a non-STLB to MI will probably go to the cath lab the following day. 
okay? They don't need to go there emergently. We're not going to be doing the morphine, oxygen, nitro, aspirin um, like we would do with somebody who ha is having an ST elevated, ST elevated MI. This is emergency. We need to deal with it right now. So if you look at the chart, so we have a non-ST elevated MI, just means it's going to look pretty normal. You're going to have P wave, QRS wave, and a T wave. Okay, with an ST elevation, you're going to have a P and a QR, and that S is not going to come all the way down to the line. If you imagine there's a line right here where, where the rhythm starts, it's not going to come all the way down. It's going to flow into that T wave. And it's going to give you, sometimes they call it like a tombstone um, EKG. You'll see the P, the QRS, and the ST is elevated. Okay? So if a client is presenting with symptoms of an MI, okay, so they're having chest pain or angina, right, and rules in for an MI, which means they have positive cardiac markers, that's the positive troponin, which we'll talk about a little later, um, if they have this ST elevation, we are going to do some emergency actions. We'll talk more about MONA which is morphine, oxygen, nitro, and aspirin. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in class. Uh, so we're going to do that emergency action. They're going to need to go to the cath lab, okay? Because what we need to do is we need to revascularize. We need to find a way to try and get blood flow to that area of the heart that is not currently getting the blood flow that it needs. So we want to think about risk factors. Um, and I'll say it again. For the third time now that the first sign of coronary artery disease is very often uh, myocardial infarction okay so and that's important to know because you could be working on a med surge unit and have a patient that you're taking care of um, that may be there for something completely not heart related at all and all of a sudden they develop chest pain and you are managing a heart attack down on a med surge floor or in a doctor's office or wherever, because it can happen wherever. So as a nurse, you should be always looking for signs um, for preventable disease, right? Because we want to prevent a patient from having a heart attack, if at all possible. So look for the signs and risk factors that patients have. They're very often the risk factors for other disease as well. Smoking, number one. Smoking cessation is huge, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in part two. Hypertension, if they have high blood pressure, are they taking their meds as prescribed? Are they ordered meds? Do we need to talk about diet uh, and exercise and stuff that they can do to lower their blood pressure? Obesity, okay? We want a healthy BMI. We want the patient to be at a healthy weight. Hyperlipidemia, so look at their cholesterol. Do they have high cholesterol? Diabetes puts them at higher risk for heart disease. Kidney disease puts them at higher risk. Sedentary lifestyle. It means a patient who basically is that couch potato, right? Or maybe they're a patient that works every day, but their job is sitting at a desk all day, okay? Stress is huge, so we want to teach stress management. Uh, heart healthy diet, which we'll talk about more in part two. And it's also important to know that women... Um, menopause will increase the risk for so once so you'll notice like with age as women get older towards the age where they will have gone through menopause that's when they're at increased risk for um, heart disease also if you have younger women so you could have a woman in their 30s um, and she could be a healthy weight but she could be a smoker and on oral contraceptives it's going to increase her risk and i have taken care of so many young women who basically those were their risk factors smoking, and oral contraceptives. So non-modifiable risk factors is age. So again, men over 45 and women over 55. Okay. Race and ethnicity, um, possibly socioeconomic status could mean like socioeconomic status. They're eating a poor diet. They're just not taking care of each other. They don't have maybe the resources to get their medications to manage their diabetes or hypertension. Um, African-American, uh, Mexican-American, Asian-Americans, and Alaska Natives are, it's shown in research that they're at a higher risk for heart disease. And then family history. 
And I can tell you personally, I have horrible family history um, for heart disease. Metabolic syndrome might be something um, that you hear and you want to keep an eye out for patients who have these um, risk factors that together, if they have all of these together, they would be considered as having metabolic syndrome and it puts them at an even higher risk for heart disease. Okay, so large waistline. So if you hear the term beer belly, you think of men who have uh, really large bellies and there are women out there too, but they tend to gain all of their weight right around their middle. Um, that puts, that combined with high triglyceride levels, so greater than 150 milligrams um, of, of triglycerides in their blood, low LDL levels. So LDL is the cholesterol that we want to be a little higher, <laughs> and HDL is the one we want to be lower. So if they have lower LDL levels in their cholesterol, if they have hypertension, and if they have an elevated fasting blood glucose of 100 or greater, they have this group of symptoms. They have what is called metabolic syndrome, and this places them at a very high risk for a heart attack. So what we talked about here in part one is these student learning outcomes, okay? So think about atherosclerosis, which is the plaque buildup in the vessels. That decreases coronary perfusion and can reduce blood flow and can lead to total occlusion, okay? That's your pathophysiology. Angina, which again is chest pain caused by myocardial ischemia, that myocardial ischemia is lack of blood to the heart muscle, um, which lack of oxygen um, with that blood, lack of blood flow, can occur when there is a partial occl an occlusion. So this is a symptom, right? So this is your anticipate clinical manifestations here. That's angina, okay? Uh, you can see that. Think about what we talked about with acute coronary syndrome. If you have somebody who's had major blood loss from whatever, car accident, GI bleed, whatever, they can have that sudden decrease of blood flow to the heart muscle. That is considered acute coronary syndrome when all of a sudden you'll see symptoms like their blood pressure drops. Um, you can see signs and symptoms of decreased perfusion. So think about, go back to, I'm assuming you did it in, I don't know, uh, semester one or two when you talked about perfusion as a concept. Think about your checking pulses, you're feeling skin temp. If you have somebody who has acute coronary syndrome where all of a sudden their heart is not getting the blood flow that it needs, it's going to affect overall perfusion. So they're going to have weaker pulses, cooler skin, uh, delayed capillary refill. So those are, those are the types of things you're going to see. Those are the symptoms you should be anticipating. All right, you should understand the risk factors. We'll go more into the risk factors in part two and what teaching we will do with the risk factors. Prevention is huge. Okay, and then um, we talked briefly about the primary symptom of coronary artery disease, which is angina. Okay, pain, that's pain, patients having pain, that chest pain, that would fall under the concept of comfort and pain. We would address those concepts. So we think about other concepts that we're addressing, and we'll talk about that more in class as well. Okay, so here we have a question. So the nurse is caring for a 36-year-old client on a med surge unit. The client was admitted for repair of an ankle fracture. The client developed chest pain, and their EKG showed the rhythm below. What does the EKG show and what risk factors based on the client's chart should the nurse address prior to the client's discharge? So if we look at their strip here, we can see that the patient has these ST elevations, okay? The patient has a history of cigarette smoking, um, of a pack a day, her BMI is 24, her total cholesterol is 176. She reports that she works in an office at a desk five days a week and she spends most of her time at home watching TV. Her blood pressure is 156 over 86. 
and the only medications the client takes regularly is oral contraceptives. So we have to think about what are her risk factors? What, you know, obviously we're going to address this first, okay? So you may not get a history. If you have a patient like this coming into the ED, they're having chest pain. This is what this looks like. We're going to emergently start managing that patient. Um, and we'll talk more about that management in class. Okay, it's not like you're going to go, oh, you're having chest pain and this is what your EKG looks like. Let me take a, a full history. Okay, we're not going to do that. We're going to start treating the patient. But for the purposes of, you know, kind of studying risk factors, kind of looking that we're seeing the patient as having symptoms of an MI, her EKG looks like an MI. So the other things we could be doing is sending blood work to see if she has positive troponin. Okay, that positive uh, cardiac marker, which we'll talk more about in part two. So we could do that to see, and then we're going to start treating her. But looking at her history, her risk factors would include smokes. Uh, well, that went by fast. Uh, those were supposed to bold as we were going here. So the patient smokes a pack of cigarettes daily. This is huge. Okay. So once we treat the patient, we get the patient stable, she's ready to go home. Some of the things we're gonna to wanna to focus our teaching on is smoking cessation. Okay, her weight is fine, her cholesterol is okay. This shows sedentary lifestyle, okay? Client reports that she works in an office at a desk five days a week and then she's watching TV at home. We definitely wanna do some um, teaching on exercise, uh, getting up and moving, and we'll talk about that more in part two her blood pressure is high. Okay, so we would definitely want to start teaching on how can we manage the blood pressure. She may be going home on some new medication for blood pressure, or we could start teaching about that low sodium diet, exercise, kind of that conservative management. That may lower her blood pressure. And then the oral contraceptives daily, right? This places her at a higher risk given the fact that she's smoking uh, cigarettes daily. So they would want to talk to her about other options for contraceptive use. And let's go to the next slide. So, and that's references. So that is part one. Um, as you guys are studying and looking at the book, make sure that you're going back and looking at your student learning outcomes. Look for some practice questions. I certainly will give you some along the way. We will talk about practice questions in class. Um, I want you to watch part two before coming to class, which is going to get more into the risk factors and the diagnostics um, for CAD, which follows along with your textbook. Again, I'm trying to follow along with your textbook, so this is an additional resource with you that hopefully will help you understand as you're reading it, because um, I know that a lot of people, as they read the test textbook they start to zone out just remember that your textbook is not a fictional novel okay it's not really meant to be read you know from start to finish and have you retain it so as you're going through the student learning outcomes and maybe as you're watching this presentation look at your book for a resource because this is just another way to help you understand the information um, so again before you come to class make sure you watch part two of this presentation look over your book uh, you will have a med list, which is going to be long and extensive. We will talk more about meds in class so that I can focus you in a little bit. Don't get overwhelmed um, with the medications. Perfusion uh, is a big topic. CAD is a big topic. Um, but I am available to you guys for questions if you should have them, okay? Um, so that is that.